I was born in Manchester, so I'm one of the first generation um, born here. So my mum and dad had come over from Jamaica. And the only person driving a car, the only woman that I saw driving a car was a midwife. And she had a yellow sports car. And I thought, I want one of them. What does she do? And because there were eight of us, we saw her quite a bit because people used to have babies at home in those days. So the midwife would call around quite often and she was the only black woman that I saw driving a car and I was like, I want to be able to do that. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And when she said she was a midwife, I thought, I like that. And my mum trained as a midwife in Jamaica. She did part of a training there, came to England and didn't get to finish it. So it was kind of there. So originally I just wanted to do my midwifery and uh, ended up doing both really, my general training um, and then my midwifery eventually. I trained at Oldham General Hospital and in them, they, in them days they had two hospitals. They had the infirmary in the town centre and the general um, and that's where the nurse's home was as well. But when I first applied to do my training they made you do these tests because I didn't have enough O-levels and um, that's what they were in those days. So I did this written test for this particular hospital in Manchester and they'd said, no, you, you, weren't, you didn't have enough marks to do your SRN, so you could just do your SEN. So I got the letter and I was like, oh, at least I get to be a nurse. And my mum just said, no. She said, if you can't do your SRN, you're not doing it. And she ripped up the letter and threw it away. I was so upset. But it was the biggest favour she did me because I carried on interviewing and then the next place, next two hospitals I went to, Oldham and Rochdale, both offered me a place unconditionally. So it was three years training. So I lived in, I chose Oldham because it was slightly nearer and um, went, went there and did my training. It was um, an interesting experience. Mm. When I went to Oldham, it was just after, it was 1978, just after the world's first test tube baby had been born there. So she was born in August and we started training in September. So we were told, if any reporters um, approach you about it, say no comment. We didn't know anything anyway, so we wouldn't be able to say anything, but we were told to say no comment. Um, and it was quite a self-contained site because most of the wards were in the one place and um, it was three years. So the first year, I was a st first year student nurse. And I think there was three black nurses in my, in my group. Um, one was born in Jamaica, uh, but she'd been here most of her life. I think one was from um, Barbados and um, they were very, um, Not passive, they were not not both of them. The Jamaican one was a, a little bit like me, but they were um, really nice, and I think they put up with a lot. Whereas um, I was born here, and I didn't think I was, I didn't think I was entitled to anything less. I mean, of course, I had to talk about you're going to have to work harder to get where you need to be. Uh, so that was kind of drilled into my skull. But it was a part of me that really resented that because it was like, well, why I was born here like everybody else, but. Um, you know, it's it's just how it was, how it is still. And um, I remember the first ward that I worked on, there was, um, it was a surgical ward. And there was this skinny woman, sister, and she shouted down the ward. She stood there, right down the ward, and it was a big nightingale ward where everybody is. And I always felt it was important to talk to people. And it was a surgical ward, so people were going having surgery. And I would talk to them and just say, you're okay. Um, and I was told I wasn't to be talking to the patients. Um, and they'd just give you a task to do. So for a day, you'd be doing blood pressures or you'd be doing getting people ready for theatre or you'd be picking them up from theatre. And um, she stood at the end of the ward and shouted, Nurse Weber, this isn't done and that isn't done. And why haven't you done that? And I went, I think about it. So I followed her down the ward. I was so, so angry. Followed down the ward into the kitchen and she turned around a bit surprised to see me and I said, if you've got anything to say to me, you call me in the office and talk to me, do not shout my name down the ward. Bear in mind I was a first year nurse. <laughs> on my first ward. 
when I rang my mum, she said, you said what? I said, it was rude. And she said, you know what? She said, you better make sure that you're in charge wherever you're working because people ain't going to put up with that. And I just said, well, it was rude. So at the end, so what she did was, she was pleasant for the rest of the time. We did like six weeks. And then at the end of it, she gave me a really nasty report. So how you progress was dependent on these reports. Um, so she couldn't really say anything about my work, but she found a way to say a lot about my attitude. So on the next ward, <laughs> geriatric ward, I decided I wasn't going to say anything. So it was all like, and I didn't answer back. And I thought I was towing the line. We get to the end of it. I got another report. This time, it was my attitude. Apparently, I was kissing my teeth. That's cultural. I didn't even know I was doing it. Um, and rolling my eyes and things like that. But as far as I was concerned, I was doing really well because I wasn't talking. I wasn't answering and saying the things I wanted to. So that was two bad reports. Three and you were out. So my tutor had me in the office and she said, you really, really have to watch this. And... The other nurses, and there was another nurse who was, um, she was an SEN, and she was really just a lovely, bubbly person. She was from Oldham, and she just got on with things, and I just said to her, why do you let them talk to you like that? She said, I'm just there to do my work. I, you know, I haven't got ambitions like you. I'm just happy doing this. And I just thought, you know what, I need to get, I need to get my, my training. I need to just get this under my belt. And, of course, my mum was like, June, please, and I was like, oh. And um, it reminded me of when I was at school and when I went to secondary school, I had to promise my mum that I wouldn't fight anymore. <laughs> I was always fighting. So I promised I wouldn't fight anymore. And I did, I said just one, but that was called for. So it was the same kind of thing. She said, June, please, you want to finish your training? And her phrase was, you know, she said, they've got the handle. She said, they've got the handle and you've got the blade. They can pull it away from you at any time. Just, just listen to what they're saying and just try, try and behave. And I was like, and um, I used to ring her up and talk to her. And then by, um, I think it was the end of, by the end of my first year, she died. She was uh, And that um, was all them 40 odd years ago, but we never got over it. And I miss calling her and telling her about what was going on. And she never got to see me qualify. So, when I went back, I just thought, you know what? I've got to do this for my mum. Because they said to me, you're only allowed two weeks off compassionate leave, for, you know, when your mum died, compassionate leave. And if you, don't, if you don't come back, then you're not going to be able to do your training. And I just thought, I've got to do, I've, I've got to go back. I've got to finish this or else it'll all been a waste of time. And I remember I was on night duty and um, I walked onto the ward, putting my belt on. We all had belts in them days. And everybody was looking at me and they went, we didn't expect to see you again. And I went, I've got something to do. I want to finish my training. So I behaved and uh, took my exams. And I lived with, in the end, I ended up living, sharing a house with, we moved out of the nurse's home, ended up sharing a house with one of the, with the Barbadian nurse. And we got on really well. But the nurse's home, that was a different experience. Oh my goodness. I'd never, because it's the first time I've been away from home. And um, of course I was homesick, even though we were just up the road when you think about it, older when we lived in Stockport. And there was a bus that came every hour that I used to get until I learned to drive. And um, I, we used to, um, so there was all of us on this corridor in these rooms. And there were just things that you just wouldn't, you, you, like you'd leave your food in the fridge on your shelf and you come back and somebody's eating your food. And I just didn't get it. Why would you take somebody else's food? And, and, and a lot of people, a lot of the girls, the English girls, just didn't seem to cook or buy food. Or you, you'd be like, you leave your, you, your rice cooking, you leave your pot on the stove, and you did. Somebody lifted up the lid. That's the worst thing you can do, lift up your pot lid. And you did. <laughs> and the Jamaican girl was shouting, don't be lifting up your pot lid. <laughs> You'd just be shouting. And, and just, it was very, very, Different, and I'm not saying difficult, but it was an eye opener how different we were. Even though I always thought, you know, we were born, I was born there on the same, but it was very, very different culture, you know, like eating and cooking, because it was just natural for me to cook, but they didn't choose to. 
and it was it was all right but i was glad it was better when we moved into the house so the house was owned by the hospital and we paid the rent to the hospital i remember when i got my first wage i felt rich i got 150 pounds at the end of the month and i still had some left at the end of that month it wouldn't happen now and i just thought i was really rich and they're taking my rent out of that so all they had to do was buy food and travel and, and buy clothes and that so it was all right and you know some of the patients they weren't bad, um, but there weren't many black patients as such. And they, it was Oldham, so the accent, even though they were just up the road, I'd like, they'd say something and I'd go, what, what did they say? And I had to get translations, you know. And, and just the older ones, with their accents, because it was a very strong accent. Um, and, and by the end of it, though, I, I understood what they were saying. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. It was mainly, you know, mainly sometimes the staff. And when, when qualified, um, I remember... Just before we qualify, we'd have interviews, where do you want to work? And I noticed all the black nurses were shoved on nights on the um, geriatric, they don't call them geriatric anymore, but the, that was working with um, elderly, elderly care. And they always put them on there. And I remember going for my interview and I said to her, I'd really like to end up, I'd really like to work on ICU, but I know I'm going to end up on geriatrics nights. And she said, why do you say that? I said, that's where you put us all. Um, and I got I see you. <laughs> I don't think it was, I don't know if it's because I like to think it was because of my skills and personality, but hey, <laughs> I took it anyway and I, I really enjoyed it. So that was my first experience um, when I qualified. Um, and it was also very scary because one minute you were, like on the Monday you were um, a third year student and nobody took any notice of you. And then the next day, the morning I got my results. And there was, um, like I said, there was myself and um, Sandra. And so the envelopes came and you knew that one envelope, I think the big one, a big one meant you'd failed and a small one meant you'd passed. And I couldn't remember which. So the, the envelopes came through and there was one of each and we were just like, oh God, one of us had passed and one of us had failed. Um, um, and, and I'd passed and Sandra had failed. And it was, it kind of muted things because, you know, I couldn't jump up and down and, um, and my mum wasn't there to tell her. Um, <laughs> I rang my dad and he went, hmm, shows you weren't messing around too much with boys then. That's what, that was my dad. So I thought, great. Don't get me wrong, he was a very caring dad, but he felt um, that I should have really just stayed away from boys till, um, probably till I was 30 or 40, like most dads do. So that was his, and I thought, he's not even bothered. And he even went round to his sisters and he didn't even tell her that I'd passed my finals. So, but apparently he was very proud. You know, just had his way, just, just his way of showing it. So it was um, a long three years, but it, and then again, it went very quickly and we learnt loads and met loads of people and um, it was interesting. There was nobody in there that said anything, but I didn't really give I didn't really give anybody a chance to do so, to be quite honest with you, because I felt that it was important to to set my stall out straight away, so then you didn't have to deal with anything. Um, and they were all quite friendly, and um, and we all we all got on well as a group. I think there was thirty of us, and um, and we all got on well. And the tutors weren't bad, but other people, their experience wasn't so positive. I mean, like I said, on some of the wards, some of the staff were just just plain nasty with you. And and of course, as a student, and I knew that I had to um, bite my tongue, you kind of didn't say anything and just got on with it, really, because that's how it was. Um, and it's amazing what what you can, what you do put up with, because you just think, you know what, I need my paper at the end of this. And, once it's you know once you qualified, you've got a little bit more freedom. What was what was interesting was when I went to work on the um, when I qualified and I was working on the intensive care. A nurse came up to me and said, "I remember you." I said, "I don't think I've met you." She said, "I was walking past the kitchen, and I heard somebody telling that sister off." And it was a first year student, and I looked because he had he had one strike, and she said, "I looked and went, she's a first year student." And everybody wanted to tell this test drop, but nobody had had the courage to do so. And I went back into the unit and said, I 
just seen these first year student games. <laughs> and I always said, if I met you, I would remind you of that. And I said, that was a long time ago. But <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't bad. <laughs> it wasn't my finest moment. My progression in nursing, I would say it's taken me a long time to get to where I am now. I'm, a, I'm currently working as a band seven and I've been working since I came to the, my current trust. I, was, I moved, moved there 2008 and I'm still a band seven. I'm still in research, which is what I moved there to do and I just... I've kind of moved from children, paediatric research, now I'm working in adult research. And and it's not through lack of ambition, it's just through, I don't know. I, 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 I go for interviews, but I just don't seem to be able to, to get the, the progress and it just feels like um, it's so difficult. And I just, I was ready to give up. I did give up and I just decided that, just, you know what, I'm just gonna retire and just, you know, call it a day. And my daughter, um, I've got two daughters, three daughters, and my eldest one's a nurse as well. She's a health visitor. But I begged her not to go into nursing. I said, they don't respect you. Pay's rubbish. <laughs> it's just such hard work. And then she, she rang me up one day and she said, Mum, I'm going to go and do my children's nursing because um, she'd gone for the interview and didn't tell me and everything. I'm going to go and do my children's nursing. I don't know how I'm going to do it but I'm going to do it because she had young children and she did it, she did it. I did my midwifery training later on because that's what, that was, if you remember, that was my ambition to do my midwifery training. And with my, I did my general training first because I felt that if I'd gone straight into midwifery, I'd have just stayed there. So I did my general training first and then planned to go into my midwifery. And what, had ha what happened was then, um, I got pregnant with my eldest, just as I was, I'd got a place at, at St Mary's um, and I got pregnant. And when I rang them up and said, could I just delay my start? And they said, well, actually, we um, we won't offer you a place. Um, just apply later. I never did get to do my training there. Um, but I did get to do train as a midwife. And um, and when I trained, <laughs> even when I tra during my training, that was fine, you know, I, we were lovely. We still keep, I still keep in touch with all the midwives. They're just really nice. And there wasn't any problems with the staff there, but when I qualified, they put me on, I just wanted to work as a midwife and they put me on special care baby unit, which was then part of midwifery. But I just wanted to work in midwifery. And I kept asking the nursing officer, please, can I go out? Please, can I work as a midwife? And then she said to me one night, there was a, somebody who qualified after me. And she said, if, we, if they're busy on the unit, she was to go out. I said, what about me? And she said, well, you haven't got any experience. And it was, I just went, I'm leaving. I just found something else. I went out into the community. <laughs> I went to, I went in the community working as, a, I went interviews as a practice nurse. And there was a GP practice in Stockport. And there was, some English doctors in one side and some Asian doctors in the other side, two practices in the same surgery. So I went for an interview with the English doctors and I didn't get the job. Then the same health ends came up and I realised that it was the Asian doctors. So I went for an interview with them and got the job. I met the nurse that the English side had taken on. Really nice nurse, um, an Irish nurse, and we, we got on really well. But she was then asking me how to do things, so I was training her. So I thought, well, clearly it wasn't my experience that was the problem. And um, one of the doctors said to me, oh, well, you know, um, we're so sorry because she felt embarrassed when she saw me there. We're so sorry we didn't employ you, but it's not us, you know, it's the patients. They're a bit, you know, funny about, you know, um, I said about what, McCullough? I didn't have any problems with any of the patients. The staff now, we had this, one of the receptionists, felt it was her duty to tell me that she wasn't racist. We have to, I, I, I'm not racist. She says, my grandson and I sit and watch the postman, he's black, and we go, what'd you say? Calling, something calling him a, a gollywog. And she thought that was really funny. Something like knick-knack, 
something on the watch, the golly wag, and I was just like, and she just thought this was normal conversation, and I was just like, these people are, I just thought these people are different. They're just really, really different. That they felt it was, she felt that was okay to share. I mean, she thought it was a big joke, and that's what she was teaching her grandson. Every time this black postman went past, um, and it was a good job. I worked well, and then I moved to Nottingham. <laughs> well, Nottingham is a different thing. So of course, I was applying to the same thing, practice nurse, and I've got a lot of experience under my belt. And I'd done, like I said, I was a registered nurse, I was a midwife. And the first job I applied for <laughs> was in Ilkeston, which I didn't realise was the head of the National Front. <laughs> so as I was went up for the interview, and I was driving along, and I kept thinking, there's no black people on the streets. What? I thought, it's one of those areas. And then I went for the interview, got in, and she went, um, uh, she was dead shocked to see me because I don't particularly have a name that you could tell that I'm black. And she went, um, well, this, this didn't, I said, I've come for the interview. This isn't really an interview. It's just, uh, you know, just, just to show you around. And I thought, I've just driven up from Manchester. And so she, um, we, we, she showed me around dead quickly. And then I was out the health centre before I realised it. And I thought, and then I got a letter a few days, about a week or two, two weeks later. I didn't hear from them. I rang up and said, I've not heard. And she said, sent me a letter saying I was unsuccessful. And I'm like, considering it wasn't an interview. I didn't even, I didn't even get my name right. I just sent this old crappy letter. Um, and then I did get a job, again, working for some Asian doctors in, um, in Nottingham. And then I got, um, I was on a course and I met this nurse and she said to me, because I weren't, and I seemed to go into the, Places, professions and places where there weren't many black nurses because I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and I don't think, I didn't think I should fit the mould and go and do, do those things. And then, I'm talking years ago now, people are going, I mean, people could be watching this and going, oh, there's loads of black nurses now, but there wasn't. I mean, there was quite a few of us. And um, I remember sitting on this course and this nurse came up to me and she said to me, did you apply for a job in Ilkeston? I said, yeah, how did you know? And she said, oh, she said, I got that job. You know why you didn't get it? And I went, no, why was that? Like, I didn't know. Because you called her, I said, yeah. I thought it might have been. Which you, at least she said it. So it seems to be more from professionals than the patients that I was, I was getting trouble. And, you know, my mum, my mum, she worked, she didn't get to do midwifery when she came, when she came over here. She didn't get to finish the second part. So she worked as, um, I used to call them auxiliary nurses, and now call them support workers. Uh, right up until she died. And she used to, she was one of those people who came home late because she wanted to make sure that everybody was comfortable before she left. And she'd come home and she'd say, this old lady would be saying, get your dirty black hands off me. And she said, I'd just carry on because I know that we needed to wash her and change her. And, and I go, I wouldn't touch her. And she goes, yeah, you would. She said, it's not about that. She said, she doesn't know what she's saying. And I just want to make sure she's okay before she came home. And I could never understand why she was like that, why she she would just put up with it. But then I realised it's part of the job. Like, And it's unfortunate that we just think it's part of the job. So progression-wise, I went and I did, I left, after I did my, my practice nursing, I went and did some, went into the private sector for a while. I decided in Nottingham that I didn't want to nurse anymore. I just got really fed up with everything. Um, I had another baby by then, that was my fourth child. Left nursing, trained as a counsellor, and became, then worked at the counselling centre for a while. Then I went to, I sort of kind of got dragged back into nursing, went and worked um, with drug and alcohol rehabilitation as a counsellor there. Um, and that was, that, that was okay too. Then, but you know what? I went to work as a manager of a community centre, and it was um, for you know for for West Indian. It was a West Indian centre, <laughs> and the, I had such trouble with some of the management, some of these old black guys, because they were they were annoyed first of all that a female had got the post. So I just thought, here we go. So. It's not my colour, it's my gender. 
And one of them said to me in a meeting, because every time I suggest something, they'd go, oh, 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 no, we're not doing that. Why would we do that? And then he'd say, I remember one meeting, he just said, you know what they say in Jamaica? A woman's mouth is like a fowl's mouth and it should never be heard. And I'm like, I'm the manager of this centre. You know, and the council were paying me, were paying my salary as their contribution. And then they kept saying to me, have you got any problems working there? And I was like, if I'd, if I'd complained, they would have withdrawn the funding. You know, they probably would have found me a job somewhere else, but they would have, would have withdrawn the funding. And I didn't want to be responsible for that. So I just put up with it for as long as I could and then moved on, really. When I eventually got back into nursing, I went into research then and worked in a private place, a private um, research facility. That was an experience. So it was, uh, when I first started, it was like dead man's shoes. So as soon as, when you first start, you learn, and as soon as somebody, the next person senior left, you got made up until my turn. So somebody had just left and I went, oh, so it must be my turn then to be senior. I'd been there a bit and they said, um, oh, oh, we're not doing that anymore. We're, we're interviewing now and uh, we decided that we know it's equal opportunity. And I was like, seriously? Of course I didn't get the job. And, but they wanted to use my skills. And so I was there working and they were trying to get me to do senior things and I'd go, not in my pay grade. And I got that fed up. I've gone for about two or three interviews and in the same place. And we're like, no, no, so, I'm sorry, you weren't lucky this time. And so last time, last time I did that, I, um, I, I, came, I went back in with my notice. I just carried my, I went in with my coat, coat on, I didn't take my coat off and I went in to see the manager, because there's my notice, I'm going. And she said, please don't go, please don't go. She said, if you, um, if, if you stay, we'll, we'll make sure you get the next position, next senior position. I said, this is ridiculous. It was just so ridiculous. And we get, and some of the sisters were just so blatantly rude. They just, you know, but I, I, I wouldn't put up with it because, you know, one of them would be shouting, shouting at me in the ward. And I just say to her, I just go and talk to her and I just say to her, you've got no manners. You should say thank you when people do things. And she'd say, why should I say thank you for doing, you, for you, tell you to do your job? So I used to say, if you'd had any management training, you'd know. And what, apparently they used to call us, there was myself and another black nurse starter, they just used to call us, oh, the coloured nurses behind our back. Somebody told us later on. Um, and it was, it, it was very difficult. So I had to make sure that my work wasn't just good enough, it was above, because as usual, they were looking for faults. And, um, and I'm also a perfectionist. So I made sure that everything I did was by the board as it was supposed to be. And you have to do research anyway. Eventually, um, promotion came up. And one of the people that I trained, they made a senior, she was now my manager. And I'd gone for this, we'd gone for, I'd gone for another interview because I decided I didn't want to work in a senior position on the ward because I'd be working with these same people who were just outrageously rude. So I wanted to work on the recruitment side. Um, I went for the interview about the Thursday, Friday. We didn't hear anything. I went in the ward and they were, I could hear, and they kind of stopped talking. So they were busy discussing it with these same people. The whole place had to be involved in me getting this post or not. And this manager fought for me and she said, so I waited Saturday, son. So I went in and work on the Monday and I said, look, will you tell me if I've got the job or not? And she said, yeah, we're giving you the job. But don't let me down. I had to really fight for you and I'm just like, I trained you and, you know, so, but I was happy then. At that point I was happy because I was out from underneath them. I went to work on the recruitment side and that was really good, working with the doctors and learned a lot. Then they said, she came to me one day, the same manager said, we're changing the structure. Because a new person came in and she was talking to me and she went, you've got, she was the one that told us that the coldest, you know, the coloured nurses, two of us, and she said, You've got management experience, haven't you? And I said, how can you tell? I can tell by the way you speak. And I went, they don't pay me enough to use it here. Because I've done lots of different training. Um, and, and being dual qualified as well, you learn a lot of things. And she said to me, um, I said, you know what? They don't pay me enough to do that. And a few weeks later, this manager came up to me and said, we're changing the structure. Do you trust me? So I said, yeah. She said, 
I can't tell you what this position is yet, but would you take it? And I said, yeah, as long as it's not demotion, I'm happy. Um, and so they changed the whole structure. I now ended up working above these sisters, the ones who, the racist ones. One of them left straight away. She just handed a notice. Um, she didn't bother me. And um, the other one stayed on a bit longer. But that didn't end well. <laughs> That's a different story. But I, I, I just never understood because I don't think... I'm not a bad person. I just like... To, and it makes you feel, is it something about me? And then you have to remember, they're not even... They don't even... They don't care, they can't get past your skin colour. So it's not about you. It's not about you not being good enough because you start, you always, you start carrying it around. There's the, there's a danger of you believing that you're not good enough and always having to prove yourself. I went into the, so I ended up working in quite a senior position in that company. And I went back into the National Health service and um that's when i started back on band seven which i've just stayed on that level um then a couple of years ago there was um a secondment came out i'd already like i said i'd given up i thought i'm not doing this anymore i'm just gonna wait till i can retire and i'm just gonna go and then a secondment came up and it was for a band um 8b part time and i'm i was seven to so the seven 8a then 8B, C and D. Um, in fact, I only found out a couple of years ago that it was a band nine. <laughs> so I just, I just never, never even thought about it because you, you just don't. And that's really sad that you don't think about it. So this, this secondment came out and I was like, um, what's the point? I'm leaving. So I made sure that I escalated it. I told Every black, you could appoint, you could apply for band seven and above. Every black nurse that I knew, every senior nurse, I sent it out on WhatsApp, I sent it out on email. I went and looked for them. I said, look, apply for this post. And somebody said, are you applying? I went, nah, you should apply. And I was like, I don't know. What for? Because by then I'd been in research and applied for, <laughs> even in research, the job I'd been in all these years. And it came up to, there was, um, position. So I've been there for all these years. I've got pre private experience before. So I've been doing research before I moved there. Went into band seven. Manager's post came up. And uh, one of our, we lost um, the senior nurse and then they, somebody took her, the, so we lost the lead nurse. And then the, um, the deputy, she took her position acting up. So that left her position um, free. So we ju I just got an email. We just got an email saying such a body's being made up. Um, she's acting up. So I'm like, so I went to see the senior one. I said, so you didn't even ask me. And she looked dead shocked. And I went, what? That I would be interested. You, she said, well, we know you can do the job. I said, so you didn't even say, would you be interested? Because this other person, I'm sure, I'm fairly sure, I got more research experience than her. Well, they gave it to this other person. And. And so, of course, when the interviews came out, that was the worst. I don't even think I got an interview because it was the worst half-assed... I don't know if I could say that word, but I've said it now. Half-assed application I've ever did. It was, it was really bad, so I don't even think... I, got an, I didn't even get an interview for that. And I went for a few more positions, and I, that's why I decided to give up because I just wasn't getting anywhere. So um, I rang the morning because the deadline for this secondment was 12 o'clock. And I rang the morning, I rang about 10-ish, and I spoke to... One of the chief nurses just put me through to her. And we were chatting away and I said to her, what's it about? And it sounded really interesting. I thought, this is just, my daughter, my daughter was ringing up and going, mum, please apply. And then my sister was there. And my sister normally, she's my younger sister, normally she gives up, but she didn't give up. And she kept going, you need to apply for this. And I'm going, what's the point? I'm not going to get it. Just apply for it, just apply for it. You can't give up like that. And then she said, I went, oh. All right, so I rang the senior nurse and it was 11 o'clock and she went, application to due by 12 o'clock, you, you better get going. So I went, I did it within an hour, sent it across. I rang my manager and said, would you support Mr. Common? She went, yeah, okay. And um, and I got, then I got, when the, when the email came through, saying I got, I, I read it and in my head it was saying, 
that I was unsuccessful with that and I even got an interview. And when it said I got an interview, I thought, wait a minute. So I read it again and I was like, okay. So I went for the interview the next week and it was, there was a panel of people. So there was about, when, I didn't know what that was, that's a shareholders interview. So there was about six people sitting there. Um, and what they'd done this time is they started to take on board a lot of stuff about making sure that there was at least, that we were represented and that there was black people on the panel. And so I went into the interview and I'm normally, I'm normally quite a confident person, but because of, I've been knocked back so many times for these interviews, I kind of went in, well, I'll just do it, that kind of thing, just just to shut everybody up. I'm not expecting to get in there. So I went in the panel and there was a couple of black faces and I, and, and, and I can't believe the difference it made. I actually relaxed and was talking to them and, and it helped me remember things. And then we went up to the senior, we went because that was one interview, then you had to go upstairs and meet the senior nurses. And there was another person there. Um, and I just relaxed and it was it went really well. I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna have a good time. I don't mind what's happening because it's it's nice. It's it's nice talking to these people. And that's how I, I looked at it. And I just thought, nah. So I, I got home. And I went home and I was upset, put on my pyjamas, sat there with my throw and I was just sitting there on the set in, and she rang me, how do you think you're going? I thought, just just put me out of my misery. And she said, um, you know, I'd like to offer you this a comment. And um, I just went quiet. And she went, you're still there? I just went, wow. Because I had convinced myself that, you know, it, that it wasn't going to happen and the same was going to happen. Um... And it was, that was one of my proudest. Apart from my midwifery, passing my midwifery, then that was, that was, I felt so proud because it was, it was two bands up and um, it, it, and it was red. You went into red stripes as well. I've always felt red suits and it's my favorite color. <laughs> so I, and I suddenly I was in this position and, and I just thought, this is amazing. As soon as I got my uniform, I made a point of walking up and down. I was in paediatrics, first of all, and there was no other band sevens in paediatric research. There was no other senior nurses in paediatrics. So I worked my way down the hospital. Um, and St Mary's, there's quite a few, and the, the maternity hospital. And in the adult hospital, there's quite a few more. But I, when it got to the senior levels, and I started getting involved with the BAME staff and there was very few, very few. And if I saw any, I'd go up and speak to them. So when I got this secondment, it was amazing. It, it was the opportunity to do so many things. I became, but before that, I'd become a Freedom to Speak Up champion because I, it was so important that people were able to to, to speak up for themselves because so many things happened and I just thought of the years if I had somebody I mean I didn't need anybody to speak up for me <laughs> funny enough but there were people who let things slide and I'd go say something say something and, and they wouldn't and so for me that was my that was my thing to you know if anybody needed to speak to me come and talk to me I, I, I'm happy to go and say it for you sit with you you know find out what you need to do and I, and I, I was very happy to do that for them too, I'm still I'm still working that capacity, and um, I've had some very I, I don't want to say interesting because that would undermine it, but it's just it's just still happening. People are coming to me and they're being treated in such a way that you just think seriously. After forty odd years, they're still treating people like that, still treating us, treating us nurses like that, and. And we're there, we get up and we go every day. We get up, we go, and we, we go to work. We put our smile on and we look after them. And sometimes, most of the time, a lot of the time it's the staff, you know, that are, that are treating you badly. And you go home and you, you just deal with it. But it would be nice to be able to just go to work and just work and not have to think about putting on this extra layer. But with the senior, the, the 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 top manager when I was doing this to come and I learnt so much, and there wasn't this nonsense. I think that first of all, it struck me that they were just normal people, and really senior people. These people were pulling the strings, and 
they were running the hospital and things that we saw come down, they decided they sat in the office and they they said, let's do this. And then of course we were at the other end, it'd been cascaded. This is a new initiative that's being brought out. So it was really interesting. When COVID came out, because I was right in the middle of my secondment then. That was then in March. And I was doing half time a research nurse, half time as a comment, and the comment was just um I just loved it. I loved the work, I loved the learning and um but it's when also I started to struggle with my with my hip and having to take lots of painkillers which made me struggle with, with the work but um physically not mentally and I would sit at these meetings and I got I got to go and meet all of them and speak to them and I'd say how did you how did you get on how did you get into this position a lot of them said such a body said come and work here and like what and they'd say and when they say um one of the things that struck me was it never occurred to me to look at you know because after you after you've been through the red stripes you're into the gold and it never occurred to me that we could that I could aim for that. I could aim for gold. Not until and somebody said to me, "Why not?" And I just like because that was something that was in the clouds, and then it made me feel so sad that it's not something that I I would that I'd even that was even in my radar. You know, after forty odd years, lots of experience, um, and still I didn't even think about applying even thinking about anything senior you know i mean i know i'm close i'm thinking about retiring soon but even now i think about retiring i just think once i've had my surgery i'm going to retire i'm going to retire then i just think maybe i'll just maybe there's just a one more one more promotion in me i might go back and try again i don't know so it's not it's not easy It broke me and I never thought, I never thought that I would, that would ever happen to me because I'm a fairly strong person. You know, I've been through all sorts, like I said, my mum died in my first year of nursing. I went back, finished my, finished my training. I went to train as, as a midwife and um, I had three young babies. My three, my kids were really young. I had um, three of them under two, went to do my midwifery and my husband wasn't nice, my then husband. Um, it was quite an abusive relationship, but I got up and went and did my training. And then four weeks before my finals, I kicked him out. I thought, I'm out of this. I went to see the senior nurse and I just thought, what am I going to do? Um, because he was helping, partly helping with the childcare. And she said, you can either put off your, put off your training or you can, you can put off taking your finals or you can go for it. I went back in the group and the girl said, you started with us, you're going to finish. And I did it. I fit up the next four weeks, I got my head down, finished my final. So nothing was ever straightforward. And when then all the different things, you know, the different jobs that I'd done, you just listen to some of the things to say to you and you just got up and got on with it. And, you know, and they just, and they didn't say you weren't good enough, but they, by then you felt you were. And so I just thought, this is me. I just gave up and just, I had a lot of, a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge and I'd try and teach the people that I was working with and then I'd even give up. Then I'd just go in and just do my job, which wasn't me. And I always said, if I ever got to that point, it was time to go. So I, I felt broken and just wanted to give up. I was working across three different sites with these nurses, these dental nurses. And so we had to get them all together, train them, explain what, what they were doing. And we weren't sure what they were doing, what we were doing and put everything together. I was working with another nurse and we did, we did it. But just as we were about to start, it was like within, we need you. This was the Thursday, we met on the Friday and we need you out on the water by the, by the Monday. Um, and as I was going around taking equipment to them, I thought, I don't feel well. 
And I said to this, I said, I'm not going to, to this nurse, we're in the car park and I was giving her these mobile phones and said, so I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to get back in my car because I couldn't actually stand up. And I said to her, I'm going to go home. Um, and everything in the bag's okay because I've not, I've left it in the boot of my car just in case it's COVID. I went, I went home um, and it, it was COVID symptoms, I realised now, and I wasn't well. But I'd also read that if, if, you, if you're isolating, this was in the beginning, they weren't even testing um, then, you used to still carry on working. So I tried to work from home, but I was so tired. I was just exhausted, still not realising that's what I had. Um, like I said before, it's the same time as Boris had it, but I didn't end up in intensive care. I went back to, eventually, I went back after a couple of weeks. Um, as soon as I felt better, I was back because I wanted to get back and, and do that. And so we, we managed this team of nurses, uh, the, of dental nurses who were amazing. And they'd had no training, but for them, one thing I felt was really important was that we put in the emotional support. Because if you think about it as nurses, we get, we're kind of used to death, which sounds really morbid, but it's a part of the job. You're used to people dying. And these were dental nurses, so very rarely... Well, they're used to their patients dying and we threw them into this role where they were going, we'd given them equipment. So if people were poorly, they were going in with these tablets, holding them or being near them while the loved ones got to see them for the last minute or last few, you know, towards the end of life and things like that. And so, so managing them was difficult. And then we couldn't, they said, they bought these assessments out. They suddenly bought these assessments out. So all, all uh, BAME staff, I really hate that word, all black staff had to do this, these assessments. Um, but it was, a, it was a paper exercise. So you did these assessments. And um, if you had any of these particular things, so of course, if you were black, which of course I was, these were all these things. If you had any particular conditions, which of course I did, um, if you were over 60, which of course I was, um, and, <laughs> and if you were overweight, so I thought, oh, that's me then, isn't it? Fat, black and old. So I, I was, <laughs> they, they decided, so, so we did all this and the man just says, um, right, it's done now. You can go back to your work. Um, uh, so in theory, I was supposed to work from home, but she didn't feel I'd be productive if I worked from home. So I still had to come in every day and work, but I didn't mind it because I, I quite enjoyed it. And I was in an office. We, I would go to the hospitals and visit to the different sites and visit the nurses um, they, and make sure the dental nurses were okay and work with them um, and support them in any way I could. Um, so, and then I'd figured out by then I'd had COVID, so I didn't particularly, it, it, it felt like it was too little too late. And, you know, we had to do these assessment forms and, and and I couldn't understand how these these forms, these questions, how they um, decided to do them and compile them. And we weren't in the room. And I was really annoyed because how could you be making these decisions about us and our future and our health? And there were no black nurses. They, they had the meeting. That, and at every other meeting, really senior meetings in Master Common, I can go to, but not the COVID ones. They said, oh, no, you can't go to them. And so they were making all these decisions about us. And at the time, they were there, it was then beginning to come out how, you know, lots of black people were dying. And I never even, I have to say from now, up to now, I've not been fitted for any of the equipment. But what I realised was as well is that, and, one, and the nurses were saying when they were putting these masks on, another reason why a lot of us were, were dropping dead was because we didn't fit, we didn't fit, we had different shaped noses. So they didn't fit us properly. And so, ill-equipped again, shoved out on the wards. And of course, you know, they were sending us to work in the most places where you were most vulnerable and where your skills were, you know, and, and you know, a lot of black nurses are very skilled, very skilled practitioners. Even if we don't recognise it ourselves or it's not recognised, and we're being sent to work with the most vulnerable and dropping like flies. It's, it's just sad and um, a scary time to be nursing. I was so annoyed about all these decisions being 
taken about us. I think there may have been maybe one senior black nurse. I don't know if she was allowed. I don't know if she was in these meetings. But I was just told I couldn't attend them. And I'm just like, but it's about us. Um, because it, before that, that was one of the things, that was one of the reasons why they did this to come. It was because they realised that there was very little. They were trying to address that. There were very little black nurses above, above Band 8, you know, in that Snowy Peaks report they talk about there's just nobody very few of us around above band eight eight and above um and i remember going to see my one of the senior nurses in research and after they'd given i you think know, this other person this position and i'd gone and spoke to them and i just said to her that you know i said it's just it's just typical i said we just don't get anywhere and she said to me, um, you can't say that. Most I've got a lot of, of black staff who are band seven. I said, any band eights and above. I said, and I can tell you who's going to be the next day, A. She even looks like you. So um, she wasn't pleased with me about that. I thought, saying anything. But what, I've just thought, I'm just going to say it because it's true. And I was right. And they all have similar features. And we talk about unconscious bias, but it's so unconscious that they don't even realise it. And when you say it, it just gets people, people's back up and you're the one with the chip on your shoulder because you're saying these things. But it's there. Towards the end of Mr Conman, I was actually out of the hospital situation because I, was, I ended up being poorly. So um, I wasn't working, I was just out of it. So anything... Um, I wasn't sort of directly involved when, when that happened. But you would, you know, you obviously you would hear people say, you know, why does that life matter more than another? And you just, it just made me so sad. You know, and then talking to my children, the next generation, because I think it has a huge impact on the younger generation. Almost because we've dealt with it, but they're second generation. So um, I'm not saying that they're saying that there's less racism. But I think this highlighted it and, and we have that dialogue more because it's made them more aware of things. So it was a big shock and a big wake up call that, you, you know, another year has gone past and nothing's happened. Even when we started working together as a team in the black nurses and the work for you know, a voluntary organisation in the community, working with black people, it was more, it felt more important to do so because because when you get so broken and broken to bits, you don't look after yourself. You don't look after your health because you're told that you don't matter. And because they care less for you, you're almost careless with your own health. You know, and in in a sense, not in a sense, I mean, that's exactly what happened to my mum in that she was, um, she was ill for a long time and, um, she said, I'm not going back to the doctors because they just keep telling me to lose weight. Um, when she finally, they finally took a blood test when they said, you look poorly. Now, for you to look at a black person and say, you don't look well, you're on death's door. They finally took a blood test in the January, told us to come in hospital. Um, apparently she refused to go, we found out a few years ago, but she said she didn't want to leave her children. By the July, she died. Um, and... She, she was working up until the January as well. And it was that, we went into the hospital and they said, um, when, when they finally took her in, they did, they did some surgery to try and put a vein, a bigger vein for the, the machine because it was a renal, renal failure. And then they said, right, bearing in mind there was eight children and my youngest brother was like 10 or 11 and my oldest and, and I was about, 1920 and they um she had all of us and they just said to her we weren't even there apparently one i went and tried to get to eat something and she went no love i'm living on borrowed time and i went what is going on and this doctor had come up to her and she said if this is the way she was she was kind of getting her head around it and said look if i've got to live on the machine then that's what i'll do and this doctor said to her frankly i don't think you're going to get home and she gave up then why would you say that to somebody on their own 
who has a big family. And then they called us in. But by the time they called us in to tell us, she, you know, she only had, she didn't have long to live. Um, but even then, and the GP, they just kept saying, um, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, like I said, we didn't do a blood test till six months before she died. And it's that they care less for us. And it's like nothing's changed. And it gets me so angry. And then you get broken and you get up again because you just think, no, oh, they're not doing this. They're not doing this to us. And, and my children, my grandchildren. And so I'm glad they're speaking out. You know, I'm glad that they're, they're doing things about it, saying we do matter because we tried and we just got knocked down, you know, and, and we got told to toe the line um, for the same same things. You know, same reason. And I'm still not ready to give up. You know, like I said, I think I might go back and maybe try again to get <laughs> to get somewhere before. I think there's one more promotion in me before I retire. I don't know. I don't know. But it's that it does. It matters. We matter. And if they, if that's the only message that they get out of it, then that's a huge thing. We do matter and we should matter. And, and that's what's important. You know, in the hospitals, you walk along the corridor and... There's still people, you know, coming up to me and talking to me and I've got young nurses just qualified and they're talking to you about the treatment they're getting on the wards and what what people are saying to them and and how they're being treated and you just think, at some point it's got to start, but I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime. I don't think I'm ready to give up yet. I think that it's important I don't, it's important that I fight and I get our community as well to just look after yourselves little things look after yourself don't leave you know there's eight of us without a mum she never got to meet one of her grandchildren you know and and you just think wow what it wasn't a waste of a life because she was a good woman and she was very intelligent but it was a waste of her health and they didn't care we didn't care about her you know and i think i'm still i'm still angry about that and i still try and you know make sure that I look after myself and make sure the kids do because, you know, anybody's poorly, you know, I said, go and, look, go and sort yourself out because we don't. We just think it'll be all right. Where I lived in the flats, I looked out and people actually came outside and they were clapping. I thought, OK. But then you looked at all the posters and there was all quiet nurses on there. I'm like, but it's what starts dying. Why aren't we on these posters? Are we in? And it's the same thing. Where are we? Why are we not on the posters? Why aren't we on the pictures saying, yeah, support the NHS? And you go in the hospital and the majority of staff are black and, and yet we weren't on the posters, on the pictures. We weren't being represented. And that just made me think, here we go again. They're happy to push us and, you know, push us out to go and look after sick people, poorly people. But when it came to looking glamorous enough for the posters, we weren't included again. I think, for me, I've been, in, I've been in nursing over 40 odd years, so there's a few, few proud moments. And even though I'd, I'd, I'd done my, I'd got my midwifery certificate, that was, that was very proud. I was very proud of that because I worked really hard um, with my young babies and um, to actually pass, that was, I felt very proud. Um, and then when I got this secondment, it wasn't just a case of, I know I was being flippant about wearing the red stripes but it was I wanted the, I wanted other people to see or the nurses that nurses to see you can do this it's and it's so important that you don't give up because they do and I don't want them to give up I want them to keep trying I want them to to get up and you know get up and, and, and go and talk to people and, and go and say to them knock on the doors and just say look we're here keep applying for jobs keep keep moving forward because it's in their faith now. They can't ignore us anymore, you know? And even this to comment, that's what it was about. And it was a big thing. It was a huge step for me to be able to stand up there and say, um, it is a big deal. 
it's a big deal that, you know, I know I'm too band, bands up. And of course, there was all the people, one person told me, you're a bit out of your depth, aren't you? Um, but guess what? I did it. I did my best. And, um, and I felt very proud about being given the opportunity to do that and the work that I was able to achieve. I'm sad that I wasn't, that I was sick for part of it, but the experience was just amazing. And I think that it's, it will, it will always put me in good stead because the one thing it's done is made me think, made me look at, why can't one of us be in gold? I'd never even thought about it before. And it's, it's widened my horizon. I'm not saying I will get to be in gold, but I, I feel positive one of us will. And wherever I am, I'm going to come back and congratulate this person because I don't think it will be long. I think that eventually they're going to have to let us in, let us be at that table. Let us, you know, put... Because you know, sometimes, you know, they'll be saying things around this table and to be able to contribute your bit, well, culturally, as a black person, this isn't acceptable or that would be better. And if you're there right at the beginning, when it doesn't come down the system and it's nonsense or it doesn't include you, you'll, have, you'll see that it's there at the roots uh, where it matters. And that's what I think for me is that see more of us coming through. My daughter, my eldest daughter that I was telling you about who's nursing, she's just got a band seven pulse and it's taken me, it took me nearly nearly all my training to get to band seven, nearly all my years of nursing to get to band seven. It was like, I've been in nursing for like 30 years before I'd got to band seven. And she's already a band seven. So, I'm so proud, you might gather, I'm proud. But I want her to keep moving and I want all of them, I don't want them to sit there. I don't want them to stay, stay at that level where they are, keep applying, keep going and saying, go for feedback. So why didn't I get the job? Keep going back and find out why you didn't get the job. Many of them just go, oh, you know, it's because of this. Go and ask them. Ask them to explain why you didn't get the job. You know, either somebody just more experienced than you or just more, and they're not more qualified than you. They're not more experienced than you. Keep asking the questions. Just let us come through the ranks. You know what? It's not just a matter of us being treated better as staff, the patients, because where I work, you've got a huge population, such a diverse community, and we're not represented in senior positions. When my dad was poorly, he was in hospital in a particular area, and they asked me if he was confused, and I'm like, why are you asking me that? Because he talks to himself, I said, well, you better carry me as well, because I talk to myself. He sings to himself, that's what he does. Then the dad, so then I said, there's nothing wrong there. So my sister came in, the dad goes separately. Is he confused? They were dying to label the man as confused and there was nothing wrong with him. How many of us? You know, he still had his Jamaican accent and because they couldn't understand him, they were saying he was confused. So once we're in the system, these patients won't get neglected. One ward has told him to stop singing, he's disturbing other patients. He became depressed and, you know, we had to get him out. He moved on to another ward. They put him in his own room and let him sing. He was back to himself. It's a little thing, but these little things matter. To learn about us, we know about your culture. You should learn about us, you should know about us. <laughs> <laughs>